and Bob, thank you for the notes on on John, so I can give him a proper introduction. I hope I can. Uh -oh. I, hope, I hope his. If I say something wrong, it's not because I memorize it incorrectly. It's, it's the source. No. If it's good, I'll just let it go. Oh, hey, uh, hey, I got to interrupt you guys. We just got an alert from the wing. This is a test of the Kentucky Wing Emergency Alerting System. Yeah. And it's from George. Yeah. So it says, please check your email and respond. Okay. So just so you know, it's probably. We'll you can find it. out if you're on the, the magic list or not. I wonder why all of our phone calls are the same. What number is that? 1410100 It's a text number. It's a text all right, so, number. Yeah, I don't know. My, mine says G stands at it. Whatever. Um, so, John Casper has a uh, uh, remarkable 30 year career in the Air Force as a, a fighter pilot, quasi test pilot, uh, retired as a colonel in 06. Um, Spent uh, a lot of time in Vietnam, which we'll let you talk about here shortly. Um, I, I presume when you started your pilot training, you went through the T thirty seven Tweet, the the T thirty eight Talon, and then from there you migrated to the F one hundred five, and then you also flew the uh, F four, F fifteen, F sixteen, A ten. I miss anything? F five. F five and the F five, and uh, <coughs> squadron commander. Vice Wing Commander? Air Division. Air Division. And then uh, I remember when I was chatting with you over at Hangar 5 uh, a while back, you were test pilot at Edwards for a while, or quasi-test pilot, has some neat stories there. Uh, so anyway, just a remarkable career from a military perspective, and then I know you flew for UPS and retired there and did a bunch of neat stuff. So wanted to give John the opportunity to share some of his neat stories with us, and um, so I think he's going to go through probably fairly quickly, and then we have some slides, and then I want to spend a lot of time with Great question questions. and answer so we can really dig into the, the meat and potatoes of this, the real stories. Ah. Got it. Got it. <laughs> and we're all adults here, so speak your mind. Okay. <laughs> and I never <laughs> could do <laughs> wing notes. <laughs> well, thanks. It's really nice being asked to talk here. What I'm, what I'm going to talk about is actually uh, search and rescue. And search and rescue from um, a survivor's point of view. Um, the slides I brought along are a little disjointed for me to use because they were done for a presentation uh, at, uh, at, at Navy North Island down in San Diego for a combat search and rescue symposium. Um, the, the rest I'm going to talk about is I'm the survivor. I'm, I'm the guy who got whacked and had to jump out. Um, the Navy or the Combat Search and Rescue Society picked it because it was one of the few examples of a water rescue opposed by enemy fire. And uh, I, until about four years ago when we did this, had never met the Navy helicopter guys who picked me up. I'd never met the A-1 guys that flew over me. And I actually thought I was in a totally different position than where I really was. And I never knew until that point. So it was really eye-watering for me. And I also didn't know how close I, I was to not getting picked up. But they let me know loud and clear. Um, went through pilot training, went to Nellis Air Force Base, checked out in the F-105, uh, second lieutenant. Um, we got about 120 hours of F-105 time. And then normally, in normal operations, you go to some squadron to kind of get seasoned. Well. My class, we all went direct to Vietnam because there were short pilots. Uh, and now, the F-105s flew out of Thailand. We never, we never operated out of uh, Vietnam. So, and our only targets were North Vietnam and Laos. And later on in the second tour ahead, uh, we actually went down to Cambodia, although we weren't there. But we did operate out of there. Um, we flew primarily strike i.e. bomb dropping. Um, it's not a real air-to-air -air airplane, um, and I'll show you some pictures of it and explain why. Because, but the big reason is it doesn't turn very well. <laughs> the one thing the 105 could do was it went really, 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 really fast. And uh, uh, as part of what I'm going to talk about, at one point I saw 820 knots indicated. And wow at about 100 feet, and it mm. didn't feel like it was fast enough. Mm. So, <laughs> in fact, one of our standing jokes was, uh, when you're rejoining, um, the wingman would call, hey, lead, 
how fast are you going? And the lead said, a thousand miles an hour. And the wingman would yell, well, push it up because I'm passing on the right. <laughs> um, <coughs> when I got to Vietnam, um, the, we, the, I flew out of uh, Karat, uh, Thailand. Everybody familiar with Thailand and Vietnam and all that? Okay. I actually, just to help out, I brought a visual aid for you. I know where they're at, but I don't know. <laughs> Here it is. There's the visual aid. <laughs> there's the airplane, and there's Thailand. The bases are listed there. And just remember this way northeast corner up here of uh, North Vietnam, because that's where the story sort of ends. So my seasoning involved going to the lower regions of North Vietnam, uh, where you got your initial training. So you could get shot at like on your first mission, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, until my eighth mission, when it was so cool, I, I managed to uh, get shot down. <laughs> and I bailed out, it was over land, uh, but that's not the one I'm going to talk about. I bailed out over land, I can tell you guys about it some other time and got picked up uh, right about at dusk. The very next day, I actually flew a mission right back to the same area. How much time in country were you from then to your eighth mission? Uh, about two weeks. Two weeks. Well, every other day you were out. Yeah, and, and during the course of uh, the about oh, five and a half to six months that I was there, uh, my squadron uh, lost uh, 16 airplanes and eight pilots. Mm. So those, these were bad times in 1966. So anyways, then I flew a bunch more missions. I got all the way up to the mission number 28. And this one, we were going uh, to bomb a rail line northeast of Hanoi, about 15 miles northeast of uh, Hanoi. It was really in bad guy land. The other interesting thing is there's a MiG base about three miles from there. And back in those days, um, you couldn't attack the MiGs on the ground. That was an off-limits target. Really? Yeah. We, we never attacked an airfield uh, the times I was there. Was that just like a volunteer? It was, it was idiocy. Yeah. yeah. Kind of the same stuff going on right now. Kind of the same stuff that the guys are putting up with right now. Um, it's, it's The wars reverted back to a top-down directed war rather than a... Uh, Let the generals call yeah. it. Yeah. Let the generals call it. The politicians are calling this one now. That's what's going on. And that's what was going on back then. McNamara and uh, the president, uh, Lyndon Johnson, they were picking the targets. And they did that every day. And so every day we'd have two goals. We'd have a morning goal and we'd have an afternoon goal. And it was kind of the same routing. You'd go up, hit tankers, head on in. So kind of the same route. Well, for this mission, Mike flight lead had had enough of this. Uh, so he said, we're going to go in low, right across Hanoi, and right up the rail line. And so off we go. So we drop off the tanker, drop down, get her, get her cooking. With a full load of bombs on the F-105, in, uh, in, uh, you could cruise at 550 to 600 knots, not in afterburn. I mean, the airplane, the airplane could really, really haul. Um, so we came across Hanoi doing a little over 500 knots, as I remember that day, kind of in a spread formation. And then to drop the bombs, and this is, we didn't have jamming pods then or anything like that. This was before all that stuff came out. And then what you do is you'd start kind of a climb to get up to about eight to 10,000 feet so you could roll in on the target. Um, we didn't have high drag bombs back then. And uh, what we normally carried were either eight 750 pound bombs. We could carry 5,000 pounders. We could carry two 2,000 pounders with uh, two 500 pounds on the outboard, and we could also carry a 3,000 pound bomb. We could carry two of those. The 3,000 pound bomb was primarily blast. The 2,000, 1,000, and 750 uh, were to dig holes in the ground, basically. Um, that, the day we flew this mission, we had eight 750 pound bombs on the airplane, and the bridge was our target. So up we go. I can see the target over there. I'm number four, so I'm kind of hanging to the outside of this formation. And about the time we started to roll in, they fired three SAMs right through the middle of our flight. 
That, that's the first Sam I'd ever seen that close. I'd seen him before, but not like he felt like he could reach out and touch him. So when it came up, one, two, and three went one way, and I went the other way, and the missiles came right up through here. Well, coming out of that, I by now then, I'd lost sight of the flight. I turned away from the target. They'd actually turned into the target. So they dropped and left. Um, I came up, and I couldn't, I didn't see anybody. There was no flak going off like they'd been on our way in. Uh, the sky was empty. I was like, I was the only guy, and it was the weirdest thing. It was very surreal, because there was a bridge. Here I was, I said, well, this is just like gunnery school. So I rolled in, dropped, and as I pulled off, I looked back, and I watched the span of the bridge drop into the river. And so I was busy patting myself on the back, and then it became very clear why there was no flag anymore, and why there were no missiles in the air. Because I looked out here, and there was a MiG-17 right about here shooting at me. I mean, I could see the, the, the fire coming from the gun, the, the flash. So I started to turn, and I said, this is not going to work very, very well. I'm only doing about 400 knots now. And the MiG-17 can really, really turn at those speeds. So I said, well, if there's one thing left for me to do, and it was a maneuver they told us about. It's called a high G roll underneath. Basically what it is, is it's a snap roll. So I tried it. I, I snapped the throttle idle, put the big speed brakes out, grabbed hold of the stick, pulled it straight back in my lap, and gave it all the rudder I could. And I have no idea what gyrations the airplane went through. But when I finally came out of whatever it was, I was pointed straight down with about maybe 150 knots of airspeed. And there was no MiG-17. So I'm, I'm thinking he must have thought he got me. So that I lit the burner, just, I almost hit the ground in that pullout. And uh, started heading for the water out to the east coast of uh, North Vietnam. I called my flight lead about then and said, I'm off, I'm out of the target area. And he goes, you're where? I said, I'm out of the target area. And he said, well, we're 20 miles away, so they turned around to come back and get me. <laughs> so I'm coming out, they're coming in, we pass like ships in the night, and we missed each other. And what, what happened was, I was actually quite a bit further north than, than where I thought I was. Now, remember, there's no GPS, there's, um, there's no TACAN signals up there. We did, we did have a little, a, uh, a Doppler navigator, which would drift about eight to ten miles an hour. <laughs> but that, but for that time, that was a fairly sophisticated airplane. So I'm going out. They miss me. They turn around and start coming after me. Once we figured out we'd missed, and I just said, "I'll, I'll, I'll meet you over the water," because we had a tanker that we had to go down and, and get fuel from out, out over the water. Um, a little bit after I said that, I saw like a glint of sun, and here comes a MiG-21 in that. So I'm the singleton running around, the lost lieutenant. Um, and so I started to turn on this MiG-21 because everybody wants to get an airplane. And after about, a, oh, about 90 degrees, I said, this isn't going to work very well either. <laughs> so I just lit the afterburner and dove for the dirt. And that's where I saw 820 knots indicated, about 1.2 some miles down on the deck, which is great for getting away from a MiG-21 because there's no way he can, he can go that fast. Um, the other, but the other problem is, is the engine eats an enormous amount of gas <laughs> yeah. in afterburn. It, 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 it's a straight jet engine. It's not a, uh, it's not a fan engine. It's a pure turbojet. And so I said, at some point, I said, I have got to come out of burner. And I could just see the coast coming. So I pulled it out of burner and started a climb and I crested a, a ridge line and all hell broke loose. I watched part of my wing come off, uh, the fire lights came on, um, and I, well, I, I kind of knew I was hit. And then, and I, I, I didn't know this, but later on when I talked to my flight lead after I finally got back to the base, he said that one of the guys in flight called a missile launch right when I pulled up, because they didn't know exactly know where I was. And the guy called a missile launch, and the guy leading the flight said, nope, that's four, he's hit. And he said I was just a huge ball of fire coming up out of the dirt. Mm. Um, but now I could see the water, and I knew if I could get to the water, 
I'm going to be okay. Because 95% of the guys who bailed out over the water got rescued. And about 95% of the guys who bailed out over the land didn't get rescued. I mean, those, those were the kinds of odds you looked at. The, the interesting thing was that even, even with all that damage, I had hydraulics. And I think what happened was the rat on the airplane must have extended itself, because I sure don't remember throwing the rat out. And uh, Norm, what's that? The ram air turbine oh, ram it would give you electrics and hydraulics. So if you lost your engine, you could you could at least fly the airplane for a while. Um, so I had good control. I can see the water I'm letting down. I pick up a glide, and I said. I said, I think I can get to the water. And the best glide speed was like 250 knots. Um, I look back in the mirrors. You know why they have mirrors in, in jet fighters? And so you can look at yourself and say, man, am I cool. And it's all of a sudden you're good for it. So I looked in the mirrors and I could see fire uh, uh, aft. And actually, I ended up with fire from the wing root aft. I had fire in the cockpit when I finally got out of the airplane. Well, I stayed with the airplane way past uh, the time when I should have gotten out. They recommend getting out no lower than uh, about 2,000 feet. I jumped out finally about 300 feet. Oh, that's how much time. And it's a ballistic seat. It's not a rocket seat either. So I'm right on the edge of everything with this airplane. Um, the, but they did say one thing. I, 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 I hit the mic button at some point, they said, and they could hear me breathing. And they said, the last thing they, they heard from me was, Jesus Christ, look at all the fucking boats out here. They're all ours. They weren't ours. So I raised the handles to uh, blow the canopy back in that day. That's how it worked. You raise the handles, the canopy come off. And I knew that's how it worked because I, I, hell, I'd done it about 35 days previous. So I was, you know, pretty experienced with this jumping out of airplane oh, stuff. Yeah. Um, and the canopy did not come off. Uh -oh. And I said, uh-oh. Well, you could eject through the canopy if you had to. You had a big steel breaker thing on the top of the seat. So I ejected through the canopy. And uh, I just remember tumbling real violently. And then I opened my eyes. I guess I always closed my eyes when I did this. Uh, and I remember, I opened my eyes and I saw all the risers come up between my legs. I saw them right up, right up in front of me, and I hit the water shortly thereafter. I have no idea uh, if, if, if it opened and I swung over the canopy. I, I don't know what happened. But I did hit the water all tied up in the risers. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the flight uh, lead said, well, he's gone in, no shoot, no beeper. So they noted the position as best they could and then started heading for, the, for their tanker uh, because they, they were basically out of gas as well. And they were going to get a SAR started, but he said, well, we'll wait and, and uh, get gas and maybe come back up. Uh, about that time, he said it was about a minute later, the, uh, they heard my distress signal. The beeper came on. That's attached to the parachute. Because when I hit the water, I went down like a stone. I didn't have any water wings deployed. My life raft was still tied to me in, its, in a seat pan. And, but I could get to a knife. So I started sawing away on these things and uh, trying to get a hand free so I could deploy a water wing. And I remember looking up. I could see up. It's really weird what you think of. I could see the, the sunlight. It was pretty late in the day. I could see the sun yeah, or a reflection of the sun. And uh, I said, oh, man, I'm going to drown out here. And that's just not right. I, I distinctly remember thinking that. Finally got a water wing deployed. It pulled me up. I finally got cut my way out of the parachute, uh, deployed my raft, got in a raft, pulled out my handy-dandy survival radio. If you don't have a radio, you're not going to get rescued. They have to be able to talk to you. And called them, and they said, we got the SAR started. Um, we're going to go get gas and we'll try to get back up to you. Well, the tanker's like 300 miles away, for crying out loud. Um, so I said, well, maybe I have a 